Good afternoon, comrades. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Forward with socialism. Forward. Forward. Forward with working class struggle. Forward. Forward. Uh, thank you, comrades, for coming. I'm happy to see everyone here, and we are so glad that we can have this time for these discussions. Um, you know, throughout history, knowledge has always been something that is capped for certain sectors of society and the reserve of certain groups, whether it's men, whether it's rich men, whether it's rich white men, <laughs> there's, there's a particular grouping that, that this has always been the reserve of. And in other societies, it's usually rich people or you know, rich men. So I think we have a space and an opportunity, and I'd like to thank, thank the comrades at the Forge for giving us the space and opportunity to be able to discuss, have ideas, think through our work that we want to do as activists. We're incredibly privileged and lucky to have Comrade Ruthie with us here today to share her long history of working as an activist, but not just that, of understanding theoretically what is actually happening within the context with which she works and bringing the theory to bear within the struggles and vice versa. Uh, the, the General Secretary of NUMSA always says uh, that the, uh, you know, it's, a, it's in, in the theater of struggle that the theory gets tested and made and remade. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, Comrade Ruthie's life has been one that's done that. So thank you so much for being here with us. Um, we, the, the topics, it's quite open. It's an activist workshop. So I think we're going to discuss a few things. And we'd really like to hear from comrades and have much more of an open facilitation and process um, so that we can get as much out as possible for all of us, so that we can learn from each other, we can think together, and we can move forward together. I think that's vitally important. So thank you. I will now hand over to Comrade Ruthie. Hello, good afternoon. I'm so happy to be here with everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Comrade Vashna. I feel like we've known each other forever, mm -hmm. even though we only met yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> and it's great to be back with my new comrades from the Forge and new comrades from Abakh Bali and new comrades from Cape Town where we met and old comrades as well, including people I might have met 30 years ago and didn't remember. So here we are together. Um, as Comrade Vashna said, we would like for this time together to be as open as possible. And so what I thought I could do, and I wish, I don't wish we were up on a high stage, but I think maybe I'll stand the whole time so, so I can see everybody. I can see everybody's beautiful face in the room. Thank you for coming. I think what we could do is maybe get some ideas. Does this sound like a, a plan? Get some ideas from all of you of what we should talk about together. And what I am particularly um, excited about trying to do is to share some of what I've been able to learn over the years from working, as Comrade Vashna said, in the theater of struggle, and also because I have had the opportunity to have the quiet time necessary to compose my thoughts and write some books. That has been a great fortune for me, and I write really slowly. My partner can attest. I have five books waiting in my head, but they haven't come out. And the time of thinking and writing is obviously a time when I am more isolated than in the rest of my life. And yet, and yet, all of this writing is the product of the political conviviality that we experience, the political living together, the joyful political living together and difficult 
political living together that we experience. And one of the things that's sometimes hard to tell, because as Comrade said, education is so frequently partitioned. Remember we were talking about that last night? There are partitions that are visible, like walls and fences and gates, that are partitions that are invisible but just as hard, like borders passports and so forth. And then there are the various partitions that are made through the sorting of people into, as some of my comrades said last night, those who count and those who don't. But we reject that. And that's why we're here. We never imagined we didn't count. Even though we know for some people that might be the case, it isn't for us. And this is why I said last night and I'll say today, what brings us together is refusal to be history's victims. That is not who we are. <laughs> we are history's protagonists, we make it. But making it means, as we learn from our comrades all around the world and through time, it means being able to have some quiet, calm time to think about the shape of our struggle and think about what comes next. That's all theory is. You know, theory is one of those words that people think, oh, oh, that's for people with PhDs. It's not. Everybody has theory. Every single person here gets up in the morning and has a theory about how the day might go. They have an idea about what to do next, even if it's not something they like or want or prefer. So when we begin organizing together, what happens is that ability that we all have as humans on this planet to make plans for ourselves becomes more important as we gather our plans together into movement. And that's where theory helps us. Whether we're thinking about how to secure a land occupation, thinking about how to secure a building occupation, thinking about how to open a border, thinking about how to protect people who have managed to slide be through a border but might not have the documents they need, thinking about how to seize the means of production wherever we are. All of this requires that we have some agreement among ourselves about what to do next. And when I say some agreement, I don't mean that we comrades here in the front of the room have an answer that we throw out into the room, everybody catches it, and we're done. It's something that we put together using the wisdom, experience that everybody brings to the problem, and the humility that everyone also brings to a problem, because there's always something somebody else doesn't understand. That brings me back to this issue of partition when it comes to education and learning. Leshna and I were talking about how Karl Marx wrote his books in the 19th century in a tone and a style that really read like a work of fiction, like a novel, like a not like a romance, but as Kamad Vashna said, like a gothic novel, you know, like vampires and Frankenstein and that kind of thing. Why did he do that? He did it because he wanted people who might be new to the ability to read to stick with the story. He wanted people who might be trying to figure out how to make their own organization 
knowability stronger to work through really hard ideas and be able to laugh while struggling with thought. I don't know that I achieve the laugh while struggling in my own writing, but I do try to use stories throughout whatever I write to um, bridge the, the leap we all have to make between the abstract concepts, let's say organized abandonment, and how that is particularly in somebody's everyday life okay, manifested in the struggle. So last night, for example, I talked about Comrade, who I think is here in the back, who had the document that showed that the land where Comrade and his <coughs> comrades have just recently occupied was bought in this, this year by Gauteng province for 108 million rand. Knowing that doesn't give us the answer, but it gives us ideas about what to do next, right? Comrade did that research. Comrade didn't necessarily wake up and say, okay, today I'm a researcher. Comrade did the research. When I worked with mothers who were trying to rescue their children from the clutches of police and prison in Los Angeles, California, in the 1990s, the mothers, whatever their level of formal education, were always doing something that we will call research to figure out more about why the state had grabbed their children and how we could loosen those fingers that held those children away from their families and communities. <coughs> research, theory, action. So that is perhaps what we can do together today. And we can start not you know, at this general level, but from the specific things that people have in mind that made you want to come and participate in this, in this workshop today. OK, thank you. OK, um, so comrades, who would like to start? I mean, if we're going to be thinking through what are some of the pressing issues you might be confronting, what are some of the questions you've had and foremost occupying you in your mind at the moment, whether it's something you're experiencing, whether it's something more general about what is happening to society. Um, yeah, I think we can open the floor. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, how are you today? Brian, how are you? Uh, my name is Brian. I'm coming from Tendisa, Maibuye. Uh, this point, Professor just raised for, uh, about someone who just made a research about the land in which that guy found that the land that doesn't belong to anyone and the community which doesn't have a, like a place a, to, to build their own houses. The people who are in poverty, the people who are suffering, the people who in need, who are in need, ne? that person was me and my crew. I am here because I'm in a situation where, in a way, I do not know where to go, what to do, and how to react. 
That is one of the reasons I'm here. It's because I know you are here with the knowledge that we need. That land only belongs to Houghton province. The same land I'm talking about, it used to be owned by, some, by someone during apartheid era until 2018 when people decided that it's no longer work, working, it's no longer useful for, for our country or community around uh, Houghton. That's when they started to occupy that land. From there, the government uh, or whoever is in charge decided to make a court order. A court order is a strategy of apartheid, meaning that once you see a black person occupying that space, you must shoot to kill. So that is the one of the challenges that we are facing today. And that's one of the challenges uh, we, we need to overcome because we are living in a overpopulated society. But next of our locations where we are living, there is an open land in which the government doesn't even know what to do about this uh, that land. But when you try and occupy that land, they come and shoot you. So, comrades, 1994, uh, when the government of our party was removed, Mandela and his comrades promised us that we will have a freedom the freedom that I, uh, I don't see today. In fact, I never saw from the beginning. The freedom which was for individuals, the prisoners only, those who are saying they were in prison, uh, they were fighting for this country in their absence of prisons, of prison. I, I, what I'm trying to say is that this freedom we are claiming to have, it doesn't exist for the poor people. It only is, exists for those who are running this country in the interest of their pockets and uh, whatever, their profit, in fact. Everything they built in this country they know that in return they will have something that will benefit them. If you are poor, you don't have a power to build something of your own. Even though you don't have a certain space to build it. Even if it's a tax shop, they will deny you that uh, two meters to build a tax shop. Because everything, every movement that you are making, they need interest. So, my question today is, how can we move forward and claim what is belonging to us? And another thing, comrades, if we don't come together, if we keep uh, like naming each other, that you are white, you are colored, you are Indian, you are whatever. Whereas we are all living in the same poverty. Mm -hmm. We will never, ever go anywhere. But guys, if we can install in our minds that we are all humans, we are South Africans, we are in poverty. Those who are in whatever, like those who are rich, they forgot about us. I think the majority is a people in poverty. If you can unite and go and do something about that, and let us not give them, them that picture of that we can afford, even uh, this jacket of two rent. Let's take something 
that shows the covert. That means the covert. That that describes your side. The kind of living that you are, the kind of life that you are living. I think if you can march, we can make a march to the right doors. They can open for us. They can listen to us. But for as long as we are divided, we are not going anywhere. And here's another thing. Please forgive me for asking this question. Since yesterday, we've been asking questions. We've been complaining. But I never hear any response on the way forward. From the complaints, questions. So I'm blessing you, our leaders to give the directions, to give the direction to those who are on, on, in, in dark, like me, today, before we leave this place, so that, because some of us, we are sent, we are, sent, we are representing the, pure, uh, the poor communities. So I'm asking you to give us something that we can give to those who we left behind. I'm begging you. Because for me to come here and go back with nothing, like with no report, it was like, it was useless for me to come here. Let us come together. It's not for leaders. It's for anyone who came here. Let's share the ideas. How do we move, how do we move forward? I am willing to die for my country. I can do whatever for the people in poverty to become equal to those who are in power. So my company and Dela, I stand on any, smell what I want. So seven then let me have a way to learn. Mama been away a waste of money. It was just a, a visit. What is it? And I just fell from there. Sing a bit now, yo. It just put my eye. Who's a way to learn? I've been a man inside. Who would this is the lady? See ya, be way forward. I'm for waiting for his dog. You pack up the seal and move the army. Where I'm very seven. You're very much a woman. You pack up the seal. The solution was then I retain. None. Nothing. You came with nothing. It's as good as wasting money to Sagniam or September, Satan was made apart. In return, we received nothing. So we tell them a comrade today. Every one tell about it last day. We must pull my today. Can we just make a solution? Who's the song in the last beginning and out? Who will just see a whoop from here? He complains, that's going out of Tana. So Tana's complain, complain, complain. But if you don't come up with it, you like, wait for what? We should go to the end of the day. Thank you, comrades. Thank you. Amanda, my comrade. Amanda, my comrade. Amanda, my comrade. We have an award that we, we, we have won. Uh, it, it is our comrade from Ekanana who won that award. But even our presidents, who's got, have won an, uh, an award from Switzerland. But my problem is our government doesn't recognize us. They were supposed, they were supposed to be. Many people who went to the airport to come and to come and and wait for that for whom she from 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 Zambia. We were supposed to change that award, but we did it. It was a, a human rights defender. Um, there was a, there was people who were killed in Kenya. She was there all the way. She didn't run away. She was there all the way. She she she's been missed by bullets and stuff, but she was there. What I'm trying to say is that our government doesn't recognize us as people as the poor. 
And who is the who is a poor person? It is not me who's not working. Those who are paying rent here in Johannesburg around, if you don't have a home, you are poor. If you are still paying rent and you don't have a home, you don't have a title deed in your name, you are still poor. And if you don't have a certain amount that is being mentioned to, 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 in your bank, you are poor. Yes, you can earn maybe 80,000, maybe you can even earn 100,000, but the kind of life that you are living, if if, if maybe around 25 you don't have money, it means you are poor. You belong with us working class. Mm -hmm. And you are not recognized by the government. The government is only recognizing those who are working, those who are bringing back the labor, those who, I don't know, I cannot say you are building South Africa because you are not. You are building England, you are building other countries, you are not building our country. Mm -hmm. We are building countries outside. And then, the other thing that needs us to come together, African, South African, everybody, is because of South Africa is a working country. It doesn't belong to anybody. South Africa, it belongs to everybody that who is in South Africa. And we really need unity to change things, to be recognized by the government. What are we going to do, the way forward that we need from today, it is what are we going to do to make the government to recognize us? What are we going to do? We have met, like I have knocked many doors, even the National Union Settlement. But when you go to the National Union Settlement, they say you must go back to the provincial human settlement. When you go back to human settlement, to provincial, they send you local. If you go to the local, they say there is no budget from where you are from. It shows that our government doesn't have answers. And then the other thing that I, I, I it was only the suggestion I'm always playing with. What if we can move away from the government? What if we can pay electricity straight to ESCO? What if the water bills, we cannot pay them through municipality, we can pay them through from the source of water? What if we can build our own gardens so that we can no more, we can no longer buy those spinach from 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 shoppers, shoppers that are being owned by the government? Because if they belong to Ramaphosa, they belong to the government. What if we can stop buying from the McDonald's so that we can show that we are we are concerned? If we can stand up as a community, if we can stand up as South Africa at the same time, if we are going to close those freeways and highways, we are going to close those freeways and highways so that we can show that we are fed up. We are being killed, we are being gunned down, and we need to recognize it. Thank you, Kobe. Um, <coughs> I'm actually not going to raise anything new, but I'm actually going to support what the previous speaker was saying. Because <coughs> at the end of the day, we cannot expect to be recognized by our oppressor. Uh, we, we might say that, yes, uh, each and every five years, we are going to vote for 400 people to go and sit in that fancy uh, uh, place of seat called Parliament busy gossiping about what's happening in our lives. <laughs> but at the end of the day, well, in fact, this is not a democracy. You cannot say that you're living in a democracy when you are given a chance to choose who's going to oppress you for the next coming four years, five years, and who's, uh, which policies of uh, the bourgeois are they going to push. There's only one type of freedom, and that type of freedom exists when private property has been abolished. Uh, uh, meaning that we must all have our communal property. We must start to become independent as at last and show that we do not necessarily need the bourgeois in order for us to survive. Yes, the state which the bourgeois are, co uh, are controlling uh, through uh, by, uh, the, 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 the monopoly of violence that they have through the state uh, will act against us. However, we must remember that those same police people who are uh, 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 the, 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 the instruments of violence for the state are also coming from our class. Mm -hmm. The only class people uh, within the police are the generals. They are the remaining are the working class. 
one wrong investment that bet with us here in the ground, experiencing what we are experiencing. Protests will never solve anything. Uh, I don't like uh, quoting history, but then uh, I have to, because we are scientific uh, beings as human beings. Uh, 1905 comrades from Russia had a lot of protests. And then with those protests, nothing was solved. There were no re re reforms. But violence was, uh, 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 was uh, expressed by the state towards the citizens of Russia. Only in 1917, when the people realized that, okay, protests did not solve anything for us in 1905, then they decided that, no, we are going to, uh, 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 we are going to stop the winter Paris and violently take the state the way the state has been uh, uh, expressing violence towards us. It's only then that the people became free in Russia. And through that, a lot of other communities learned that we must actually have violent revolution in order for us to uh, recognize ourselves as free people. Yes, we can form those uh, independent communes, which we do have to form. But at the end of the day, we'll still be subject to the state, which is uh, uh, which is uh, uh, having monopoly over uh, the markets, which is having monopoly over uh, 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 violence uh, through its masters, uh, the bourgeoisie and uh, the, its police and the military. Thank you. Um, when I first heard about your talk yesterday, um, about organized abandonment, um, you know, I hadn't read about the term before. I first thought of um, a different term that some other folks use called destituent power. I didn't realize organized abandonment was going to be discussing how um, capitalist systems, in fact, abandon populations. I was thinking it was going to be actually about a certain type of power, organizing power, where we organize to abandon the state, right, where we abandon our support, where we abandon our um, sort of um, investments in uh, the systems that oppress us. Um, you know, uh, in different places in the world, different types of mutual aid and community building look very different, um, depending on the like cultural and economic situation. And um, I haven't been living in South Africa for some time, and um, so I'm still learning the landscape, um, the political landscape again. But um, I'm very curious. I think if people here in organizing spaces who I'd love to hear from and um, hear about the kinds of mutual aid and community support groups um, that, uh, that people are working in to build community power that is separate from state power, as our sister from uh, Zambia was saying, you know, um, and my brother just now, uh, you know, there's a certain point where we cannot expect the government, in fact, to solve our problems. Uh, and of course, there's a certain point where, they're, where our, our rights and so on need to be recognized, we land back, and so on. But there is only a certain point at which we can really trust all that needs to be met from the government. So as somebody new back to South Africa, I'm just curious to hear um, how people are doing this kind of organizing um, and building community reliance and retracting our involvement in, um, in state institutions, in capitalism, and, and building more sort of utopian or like socialist, um, communalist uh, networks that rely more on one another. Anyway, it's just a question for folks here. Um, I know you have some experience organizing or well, meeting organizers in South Africa, but um, you know my experience in the US is very different. There's such a surplus of material wealth that sharing mutual aid is, is very different because there's so many resources that are wasted by rich people that can be repurposed and I know it's not the situation here. Yeah. So 
I'll just have a little interlude, and maybe Comrade Vashna will say a few things as well, and then we'll have another round uh, of, of questions and interventions. This has really been great so far. Um, let me start with um, the last point about, oh, what did organized abandonment mean? Which is completely understandable how you thought about it. Um, the, the purpose of trying to think through organized abandonment as we discussed it last night, as we have discussed it at meetings with communities uh, here uh, in Cape Town and elsewhere, is to think about the, uh, the steps, the decision-making steps that make possible the fact that our first comrade who spoke has told us very clearly, there is land, there are people who need houses, there are people who are trying to occupy that land which belongs to this province and they are being met with organized violence. The purpose of thinking about organized abandonment in a context where there isn't a surplus of resources, even though in this country there are people who are filthy rich and this is a very, very, very wealthy place. But the resources don't stick. As my comrade was saying, people who build work here are building somewhere else, right? The resources don't stick. Whether we're thinking about, well, let's take a simple example. If you live in a community and all of the food provisioning is taken care of within the community, even if money changes hands, cash money changes hands, some significant portion of that money, of those resources, stays locally. Now some of it has got to leave because locally nobody owns electricity. Locally, few people own the water. There aren't wells that you can just drill down and get the water. Locally, people don't own the gas. You have to get parafina, or you have to get you know, that other kind of gas. You were telling me about a comrade the other day. Right? So some of the resources leave, but some stay. When there is something like a shopping mall or a McDonald's, that means more of the resources leave. You go to McDonald's, you buy some food, it tastes good. I really like McDonald's french fries. It tastes good. But when you put down your rent for that food, the minimal amount of that rent stays locally if the people who work there live locally. The rest of it leaves. Right? So this is a pattern of economic activity no matter where you are or who you are. So then the question becomes, how do we create our own partitions? So this is, I think, what you were thinking about, comrade our own partitions to keep resources within communities. These partitions need not be violently secured, but they can be secured because of unity within communities. That what we already see in Abakhwali communities is socialism from the ground up, where people are sharing resources and energy however modest those resources might be out of their, aside from their own <laughs> brain power and muscle power, right? But it's the combination of brain and muscle that makes us able to build the world. So then we get to the more specific question of what is to be done right now. There must be people in this room, as the first comrade who spoke said, who have some experience of figuring out how to stop an eviction in order to make it possible for a community to establish itself. Now, when I say stop an eviction, everybody knows this. That all it means is slow it down, right? Get some time. And each 
round of getting some time enables something else to happen. I mean, we don't actually have the capacity to blow up the system, however much we might want to do it, blow up the system and start fresh. So is there somebody in this room who has experience of doing the fight against the bureaucracy and through whatever system it is, courts, bureaucratic offices, I don't know, but somebody here does, that will put some friction up that will slow down the forces of eviction from that particular occupation. If you don't know, but you live in a self-built community, you must know someone who does know. And this is the kind of information we must share, which I imagine is widely shared in the greater Akwali community. I imagine, and if it isn't, then today is the day to start, right? If it, if it isn't, it's not because people are holding it like private property, it's just that the infrastructure for sharing hasn't been made yet. But it can be made, and it can be made here through the forge. This is why the forge is here. It's here to make it possible for people to have and share the information we need to fight better, right? And some of that means thinking theoretically, some of that means having the practical advice. The other issue I wanted to discuss briefly is, again, what is particular to South Africa, as I understand it, is not unique to South Africa. And if we look around the world, there are possibilities for really strong internationalist connections, some of which are already being made between, for example, Abakwali and the MST in Brazil. The MST in Brazil also goes off and works with people who are doing land occupations in Indonesia. They do work with people in Mississippi, which is in the United States of America. We're the poorest, just about, of all people in the United States live. The poorest are actually in the city of New York, the richest city on the planet, has the poorest people. So thinking maybe about how to imagine and then act on the imagination of what organizations that have been around for a while, even longer than Abak Ali, have done to secure occupations and to flourish and trading, exchanging that learning and given the remarkable capacity we have when there is electricity to communicate across long distances with devices makes this kind of work possible. And then the, the last thing I want to say is, yes, abolish private property. <clears throat> abolish landlords, abolish private property. Yes. Uh, yes. In so far as this province has bought that land, for us to think that that land is already ours is not a bad thing, but a good thing. But then it's a fight to realize that land is being ours, which goes back to who knows how to secure the, the occupation. The, the problems of making greater and greater um, concentrations of energy that can make demands is not the same as begging the government or begging capital to recognize us. This is not, we're not here to beg, but we are, are we not, trying to figure out how to get what is. And if we don't have it, somebody else does. And to get it, we have to use our combined strength. So, Comrade said at the outset, if we don't unite, then what? And then the question is, should there, should there be events like marches and protests? It is true 
that a protest doesn't solve anything. It is also true that it takes a lot of organizing to have a protest, which means there's already some infrastructure in communities that then can build for the next thing. Um, I'll give an example from another country, India. Um, there have been struggles of many kinds throughout India over the last however long. And while India has been nominally a democracy since 1948, South Africa nominally since 1994, there are many similar features to how the shift to so-called democracy has happened. But what is most striking is that while there is a group of people who have benefited enormously, 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 that country, like this country, remains a country of poor working class people. Now, many of the people there as here live in rural areas. Many of the people there as here work in agriculture and rural extractive work, taking things out of the ground. Many of the people who live in cities are living in self-built communities, whatever term you want to call it, as here. And many have a very difficult time, as here, gathering through work and other activities enough cash resources to pay for the things one needs cash to pay for. So we don't need cash for everything, but there are things we need it for. Over the last decade or so, the government in India, like the government here, has gone on high intensity of organized abandonment of the people of that country. Right? This is very similar, and there are reasons for it. India, South Africa. High intensity organized abandonment. So this comes from uh, uh, laws passed in the central government that the capitalists, whether they're Indian capitalists or foreign capitalists, promote. It's happened in some, many of the states, which is the equivalent of provinces here, that again, the capitalists have promoted. But it isn't the same everywhere. And India, like South Africa, is not a land of history's victims. It's a land of poor people who are figuring out how to organize for their own liberation. In the last two years, in the uh, after, well, in the high moments of COVID and then its aftermath, in the, I started to say spring, that's not right, in April of 2021, in India, there was a general strike. 250 million people put down their tools. 250 million people one day put down their tools. Now, this was not spontaneous. This was not something people woke up one morning and said, oh, I'm not going to work today. It was the result of lots and lots and lots and lots of organizing. So then we ask ourselves, who organized it? Who did this? Who are the organizers? So they include the equivalent of Abahwali. They include the equivalent of Numsa. They include the equivalent of the Communist Party, the radical fringe, at the, uh, wings of the Communist Party and Socialist Parties. They also include, notably in India, a strong and constantly getting stronger movement on the part of the Dalit people, who are the people who are at mostly the bottom of that society, huge portion of the population, who are also the people who tend to be the farm workers. The people who organize are people who are members of various indigenous communities around that big country, who are, have been pushed off the land 
or never had possession of the land because of um, uh, essentially feudalism. There's still some guy with a title who thinks he owns it. And if he can act on that thought, that means he does own it until the day he cannot act on that thought. And then he doesn't. So they organized, farm workers. They came from all over the country. Also, also, some farmers organized. There were farmers in Punjab. Northwest, thank you. Do you want to finish my no, talk? Please. Thank you. <laughs> there were farmers in Northwest India, uh, particularly Sikh farmers, who had organized really intensively. Now, there are contradictions here. They weren't necessarily looking with gratitude at the workers on their farms, with whom they would certainly be having struggles, but they were also seeing that the government policies around agricultural goods were going to reduce their ability to be farmers. So they harvested their crops, put away some store, and then came and occupied the capital of Delhi. They had an occupation that went on and on and on. And in the context of that occupation, they brought trucks, they brought tractors, they had teach-ins, constantly around the clock, people's consciousness was opened because they hadn't expected, perhaps, the Sikh farmers to do this. But that, in combination with all of the organizing that had been happening in fits and starts across the country, sometimes successfully, often unsuccessfully, <coughs> finally culminated in that strike. Now, I will say to you, that some people say, oh, we don't really know. Maybe it wasn't 250 million people. Let's say it was only 200 million people. That is an achievement. And it is, again, most importantly, it's an achievement that shows us something about the density of organizing on the ground. And that density has a lot of variety. There isn't, there isn't a single party that is directing it, even if there is a relatively unified goal that more of the people than not are working toward. That is, that is an important aspect of that struggle, and I think an important aspect of struggles here in South Africa and elsewhere. Whether or not people wake up in the morning again and say, today I am a communist and I will do this, if they are fighting to make property belong to all of us, then we're working toward a goal that somebody who wakes up and says, I am a communist, is also fighting for. And the reason that I bring abolition into the picture is to go back to what I said at the beginning. Organized abandonment cannot be maintained unless the forces of organized violence are there. Like brother was saying, that the cops, not the generals, but the cops come from our communities too. This is true everywhere. It's a job opportunity for modestly educated people, right? So given that organized violence and therefore the expression of what lets organized violence off the leash, which is criminalization, means abolition is actually part of the picture too. However you think about prison. I'll get to you know, talking you off the ledge of prisons some other time. But organized violence and criminalization are part of what keeps the class down. Austerity is class war. This we know. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks, uh, Karmavithi. I think I would just like to add for Comrade Brian that um, yes, I think the space is important because we're here to think together. And we might not always have the answers, but for sure we know comrades in Abashlali who will have some answers. Um, and I, if you also give me your contact details, we could speak later uh, uh, about that. And I think that should go for all of us in the room mm -hmm. because we all are here together. And uh, Comrade Longley said, you know, what is the way in which we are able to ha draw on social capital? 
for a want of a better word, of each other. This is a, a place for us to begin to do that. This is the place for our comrades in Numsa now who are here, our shop stewards, knowing our leadership in Numsa, knowing that there's these struggles and making links immediately with this. I think one of the things we do have in history um, is, is a method sometimes of how to do this. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not that we're always starting from scratch. Mm -hmm. This rich history of how to organize, there is a long history of it. Our comrade here spoke about 1905 revolution in Russia and that it was violent and not much came out of it. Well, some things came out of it. Uh, the Tsar had to give up some of his power, mm -hmm. right? So there was this, this, this protest, which is actually a, a long while in the making. And there were this, and it was violent, and there was violence from the Russian monarchy and state against ordinary people, mainly women actually, because it was like a Sunday. And this leads to violence. But what also leads to is people beginning to realize they need to organize from the ground. Mm -hmm. And those years, those years directly after 1905, led to an opening up of the press, it led to an opening up of discussion, of people being able to speak in spaces like this that were being created for the first time in Russian history. Mm -hmm. That was not allowed before that moment. And that's directly through this you get the creation of what is called the Soviets, but it is these individual, these communes, mm -hmm. these small communes of workers who are building organization, who are struggling together every, at each struggle, at each struggle they face, whether it's an occupation, that's one side of struggle, <laughs> but then you move from that to the factory, that's another side of struggle, and you are learning, the land occupation is a different type of struggle, it has different forces, the government is involved, when you go to the factory floor it's different, you are dealing with capital, sometimes local white racist capital, other times international capital through something like BMW or Mercedes Benz, the, the debates are different, but we need to share that knowledge with each other constantly and this history. So by the time you come to 1917, in fact it wasn't that violent. There was very little violence in the 1917 revolution because people were ready uh -huh. to seize the power. And one of the things they do is, you know, get take over the electricity stations, take over the railway lines, take over these places because they know they have the, the resources to, to do this. One of the things that happened a few years back uh, when they had the yellow vest protest in Paris, uh, CGT, which is another metal workers union in uh, France, our comrades in Numsa know that well, a sister union, they closed down the electricity for rich people in winter, but kept the electricity for working class communities going. So it was load shedding for the rich, right? Now that is not begging anyone that Comrade Ruthie said. That is demonstrating the power of the working class. Because it is the working class that's producing this power every single day. Why is it that Praveen Godan or bloody, what's his name, Reuter, get to decide who gets that electricity? Mm -hmm. Are they are they manning those power stations? No. no. Praveen Godan wouldn't even know what a bloody electricity circuit board looks like. <laughs> I mean, hit him on the damn face. So the issue is that we need to take that power. That is why the strike is so powerful. You could have comrades from the EFF sitting in parliament for years now. How many elections, two, three elections have passed to them? Is there land? No. Is there radical economic uh, reform? No. No, because they've been taken into that same system that Comrade Ruthie was talking about, that bureaucratization, those different structures of the state. They're not transforming it. They're sitting in parliament debating within the very strict structures of parliament and not taking the power. Yet, if you go and strike comrades, you are able to negotiate your wage because the bosses know you are not there to actually build their cars. Okay? So I think, I think comrades, that is vitally important and that's what we need to do. We need to understand our power as the working class. We need to understand our power as ordinary people. Whether you're a domestic worker, if you don't go to work, people's houses don't get clean. And I can tell you those madams don't know how to clean their houses. <laughs> so what do they do? They'll come to you. They'll ask you to come back. They'll beg you, right? So we need to work through this. And those are the sectors that are incredibly difficult for us to mobilize and work in. But we need to share our resources. There are a lot of people here who have access to education. 
through, 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 through their lack of birth. But that education that they experienced, like myself, wasn't as a result of my own ingeniousness or my family's wealth that they created miraculously by themselves when everyone else is rendered poor. No, it comes from the taxes paid by the working class. It comes from the collective building of a community that allows us. It comes on the back of all those people who fought for apartheid so we could go to all types of institutions of learning. It's not your own victory. So if you have the privilege of having that, please put it in use with comrades together. Show your solidarity that way. That is absolutely vital. Thank you. Lelo, we have one here, one there. Um, okay. Okay. Um, my name is Samir, I'm from the University of the Western Cape. Thank you so much, this has been a very um, interesting discussion. I'm imagining a sort of different history for South Africa. I mean, if we can imagine that apartheid ended in, say, 1968 instead of 1994, or even 1964 instead of 1994, we can maybe look at countries like India or like, say, Tanzania. Tanzania a bit closer to home. And I think what we probably would have seen in this imaginary history is we would have seen a much more complete exodus of white capital. We, would, we wouldn't basically have many white people here at all. We would all more or less have gone. Yeah? If we look at other countries like Tanzania and so on, maybe they had fewer settlers, but there were hardly any white people left in Tanzania or Mozambique or some of these places. Yeah? Yeah. They've gone, right? And then what you're left with is I'll tell you what my, so I, like uh, Comrade uh, Ruth, I, I also come from sort of the international space. I've done a lot of work in many different countries. And what our brothers and sisters in other parts of Africa say about South Africans, I don't know if this is true, but this is what they say. <laughs> they say Better be careful what you say. <laughs> what they say is that we are, uh, we feel very entitled. We have a sense of entitlement, right? In other words, we received our liberation in 1994, and now the state must give us a job. They must give us uh, an income. They must give us a minimum wage, whatever it may be. Yeah? And when we look at those other histories, we look at Tanzania, we look at India, for example, there was a period of time when the state and the people, at least the perception was, I don't know if this is reality, the perception was that the state and the people are on the same side. We are building up the infrastructure together. We, we lost everything. If you look at a place like Mozambique, I mean, the white folks destroyed the stuff. I mean, they put cement in the pipes. Like, they literally destroyed the place before they left. Yeah? So we have to rebuild it from the ground up. And we are involved in this nation building project together. You know, and you can start something. I can start, if I start unclogging that pipe, if I start breaking the concrete, if I start building a new pipe, someday, the government will support me because I'm doing good work, right? I'm doing the right thing. I'm trying to build up new infrastructure. I'm trying to build my home. If I occupy a building that was left by white people and there was one you know, big you know, mansion in, in Mozambique or whatever, maybe in Maputo, you know, there was one family living in there and I occupied with 10 families. Sooner or later, the government may come in and say, oh, this, this really isn't built for 10 families. Let us help you to make partitions and make it proper and so on. Yeah? That is, you know, we can argue about whether or not uh, Fred Imo actually did this in Mozambique, but that was at least the rhetoric. That was at least what they claimed they were trying to do. In South Africa, we have a different problem because I don't think, it, you know, I think now we know that the government and the people were never really on the side, the same side, right? And some can say that apartheid in some sense, or at least apartheid interests or capitalist interests, never really left the country. Mm -hmm. And so we are still continuing the legacy of colonialism or maybe colonialism with, you know, led by black people instead of led by white people, right? So I, I just put this out there to say, um, you know, when we're talking about very concrete things, like what Comrade Brian explained, his situation and, and, um, and, and so on, we really have this conflict, right? Do we, are we, is the state going to, this is something that is owned by Gauteng, is, is the state going to do the right thing and, and empower us? Not de facto, right? We have to change people's attitudes. And it's not just the people on the ground doing the work. Of course, those people, uh, what we find is our attitude will change through struggle anyway. We will learn things. Those people must lead. They must lead other people. They we must have a better communication strategy. So that because I, I didn't hear about this particular occupation, or when I was, uh, you know, when I'm talking with other comrades, I used to work with some comrades who were doing a, a common, uh, uh, something in Orange, um, 
was it Orange Farm? I forget what it was called. But it, it's similar, yeah. similar uh, occupations happening. Yeah? Um, I didn't learn about those things from the news, although I'm kind of a news junkie. I read every piece of news I can find. Yeah? I can't find that on the news. I can't find that, and therefore, you know, if I can't find it on the news, it means that no one is having that discussion in the broader society. Right? What should be done with all the abandoned buildings, even within a five mile radius of where we are having this talk? There are, I don't know how many, but at least a dozen unoccupied buildings, right? The conversation about what to do with that is simply not happening. And we have allies, I know many comrades here have allies in the media, some of us write for the media and so on. We must be doing a better job, not just of organizing for our survival, but organizing to also change public perception around these things so that one day, inshallah, we can talk about prison abolition and so on, you know, where we want to get to. It's not going to happen out of the blue. We need to actually move the conversation to that level. So anyway, these are just some thoughts. Just behind you. Yeah. Musa, yeah, right by you. Oh. Okay. Uh, I have a quick question for uh, Professor uh, Ruth, or if anyone else wants to answer. Um, because this is an activist workshop, I wanted to hear if you could share a personal story of an example of one time where you were in conflict with your own comrades, mm -hmm. and a way that you solved that and held each other accountable. Mm -hmm. Because I feel like as we're working towards our liberation many times in our own spaces. When we get into conflict, it leads to dissolution mm -hmm. uh, and actually us enacting some behaviors that you know are seen by the oppressor. So I would just love to hear an example uh, to learn from of conflict and how you solve it. Okay. So I'm I, I'm str I struggle a little bit with the uh, the concept of alternatives. If the the conversation around building alternatives or kind of like um, sharing resources within our communities is not a about kind of building models so that we can seize power, right? So there, there's something for me about how sometimes in our struggles, uh, even with kind of just the example I like to use is um, around, you know, women's emancipation. And we start talking about, yeah, we can go and sew clothing and make food gardens. And we're not talking about, well, we must take the banks, we must own the retail sector, we must build, you know, wealth. Um, and so I, I, I want to, yeah, I want people to assist me in kind of how do we constantly make sure that as we build the alternative, build the model, we're not um, kind of keeping it there, but it is towards a much larger uh, and a much more unattainable um, kind of to our mind's eye political agenda, which is why for me something like, uh, well, the, the space around abolition is so exciting because it the this question of then what will we do is a question I'm not necessarily interested in because that's what we must be figuring out together. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that's my intervention. I'm I'm working through how to uh, try to do that without romanticizing a very modest existence and to not also and this is the second point around kind of you know a government are people who we give our taxes to money to who we give a monopoly over the use of violence etc etc at no point do i ever want to see myself saying um the government can't uh i can't expect them to I absolutely should. I absolutely should because they've been, if then they are un unable to perform, then we need to think of a new way. 
but we can't be um, okay doing the work of the state and then be comfortable in it. We do the work of the state in any case, but that shouldn't then be a way for them to, uh, to, to you know, abdicate from their responsibilities. And I've, I've heard our state officials often, right, in this, I mean, these people march with us and I never understand how. <laughs> it's like, how are you marching? And you are, like, how does the ANC match? <laughs> it makes no sense to me. Um, and, you know, there, there was stuff they were saying around the, the recent gender-based violence summit of, yeah, also civil society must be accountable. And our question is to who? Mm -hmm. And that's not something you can ask me. Mm -hmm. You must be accountable to me because I've given you certain power. Mm -hmm. So like this idea that the government and the civil you know, space is in a horizontal relationship mm -hmm. is so the government can do a little bit and we can do a little bit mm -hmm. and make South Africa better together. That's Okay, I was going to use language that isn't it. <laughs> <laughs> you can do it. Yeah, these are grown-ups and Instead of just 
fighting again, individual land struggles, what do we look like to just push for land redistribution, which we haven't done since we got, or at least done properly, since we got the constitution in 1996. Um, then the last thing I was thinking about is constitutionalism and urban spaces, new scholarship um, emerging now at looking at the city as a constitutional actor, because we tend to think about constitution and constitutionalism and enforcing the rights about of the constitution at a national scale. Um, that we don't always look at other organs and other levels of state as also having constitutional responsibility. So, for example, when we're trying to fight for housing for land and for services, all these things, um, not to not just look at you know local government as a service provider, but also as a constitutional actor that has a responsibility constitutionally and, and, and yeah, to do to, to provide that. Um, and then related to this point, I've got a number of points out of this constitution of the urban space. Um, there has been over the last while a real convergence in terms of um, case law, looking at the convergence of um, like a judicial convergence um, of housing and land and citizenship under the sponsor of rights of the city. Um, and so it is actually becoming from a jurisprudential point of viewpoint, from a just a reasoning and a theoretical viewpoint, becoming easier actually to litigate these things um, in court. Um, and actually, whereas before, if you look at the early constitutional court judgments, you know, this, this thing of, yes, we've got to move towards transforming um, the country, but you know, this thing is so hard, you know, is socioeconomic rights really justiciable? In other words, is it really something that you can litigate? Is it really something practical? Does it save enough money? So actually becoming um, much more, I mean, the, the judgments that are coming up now are, are really, really, outlining in very practical and clear terms like what it looks like in the state to actually make good on those promises. Um, and then I just wanted to speak about the donors case, uh, Adelisi case, sorry, which is a case um, that was heard in the KPI court, um, it was about 2020, where um, a piece of land was sold uh, in the city of Cape Town for a lot of money, I think it was like 130 or so million rand. Mm -hmm. um, and it was sold, you know, to a private entity. And a social movement and city poor people living in, in Cape Town actually took government to court about that. There were like 11 different respondents. And that while they were saying that they can't force the government uh, to do a particular thing with a particular piece of land. Right? Because of the context of our past, um, and even though sp spatial justice is not outlined in the Constitution, um, doing things, I'm trying to make this simple, sorry guys. When government does things that doesn't take into consideration spatial equity, it is equivalent to not upholding the right to equality. So what we're seeing now is um, the, 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 the right to, to housing and the, and the right to land um, not being realized in coupled, at least in a philosophical <coughs> way, to the right to equality. Why that's important is because the right, our, our, our legal thinking around equality is much more developed than other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. and, and so for one thing, and then also secondly, um, sorry guys, I'm almost done. I'm just trying, to, while I'm speaking, I'm trying to make it simpler as I'm speaking. Um, it's not just poor people trying to take rich people's stuff. Let me put it that way. Right? Mm -hmm. That's often what gets said. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But actually that right, the right to equality which is enshrined as a pillar of our constitution, of our constitutional democracy, um, is tied to things like housing and land. And I know that sounds like, yeah, duh, like of course it is, but 
Establishing that in a code of law is very important, actually, because um, it makes every fight after that so much easier. Um, so it linked access to land and access to housing, and it, 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 it actually um, emphasized the need for cooperative government. Right? And that's why those 11 respondents were so important. So it means now that transport, housing, water, um, all of the, the necessary government departments actually have to work together in order to support, support COVID. But what would happen before is that you would be sent from pillar to post by different departments. Oh, that's not our responsibility, that's not. No. <coughs> now you can say, well, according to the NDC judgment, y'all are supposed to work together. It's not my problem if you're not working together in order to help me, right? And then the last thing that's very important about this judgment is that um, it emphasized the social value of property. Right, because property isn't just an economic, an economic thing. So when, when we're fighting for, when we're fighting for housing and land, it's not just about redistribution, redistribution of which is very important. It's because all of us have a right to live, and live decent lives. Right, there's a social value to all these things. And before, these things could never be spoken about and believed by people in power. And now, because of this judgment, I know actually property isn't just an economic asset. It's so much more than that. What people are fighting for is so much more than that. And so I guess what I'm really trying to say is that, I mean, I suppose most left-leaning people are very circumspect about the law and about the state, and, you know, because of this organized violence, right? And I agree. But the reality is it is a tool that we have to our disposal. It is something that you can use. If you use it strategically and you use it smartly, mm -hmm. and if you keep abreast with the developments, it is developing. Constitutional litigation now looks very different to the 90s or the early 2000s. Mm -hmm. And we can actually fight now at a much more broader level than before. Now it's not just about this piece of land and are oh, you going to kick me off this piece of land, but it's about this broader idea about equality and citizenship and who has the right to the city and who has the right to have a decent living. Um, because that's the key, actually. It's not just about bricks and mortar. It's about actually fighting for a different kind of life, a different kind of society. Thank you, comrades. That was fantastic. Have, it, is there material, are there um, articles that have been published about this recent um, set of judgments that you were just talking about so eloquently um, that make it very clear how courts have said all of these different elements come together under what um, previously people might have thought um, equality meant was only about individual integrity or something? Is that written up? Yeah. Great. We need that. We need that. So we will we will we will circulate this. Tana. 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 Yeah. All right. This is this is totally crucial. It connects to what Comrade Brian was talking about and everything else. The second thing I want to say is um, I, perhaps you weren't here last night. I actually want the state. I'm not an anarchist at all. At all. I want it. And I wanted to do the things that you have described. And it's the fact that the state has been seized in the way it's been seized by neoliberal capital and that the state's default legitimacy has been only, principally perpetrated through the forces of organized violence that we see criminalization being the solution rather than the things you're talking about, which have been hard fought too. So yes, yes the courts. The tactics, the tactics that we use to fight any fight have got to be multiple to get anywhere. Mm -hmm. So, you know, earlier I was talking about how, you know, using India as an example, there were all different kinds of organizing happening in order for that strike to happen. And that strike's purpose was, among other things, to compel the central government not to pass some laws, right? As well as to compel employers to pay wages and so on and so forth. Um, if we look back across history, as Comrade Vashna was talking about in, in discussing the revolutionary, long revolutionary period, 
in um, Russia at the beginning of the 20th century, we see also there are you know, com combinations of tactics, combinations of tactics always. And certainly in the US case, for the US to have gotten through American apartheid and to have at least in the letter of the law destroyed Jim Crow mm -hmm. meant that the organizing had to be in every single front. Mm -hmm. And while it appears in the US case that Jim Crow ended because the highest court in the land in 1954 said separate but uh, equal is against the Constitution, that happened because ever since the beginning of Jim Crow, people have been organizing and fighting in all different ways. So that culmination, although it appeared to be judicial, was also political, right? Though it appeared to be ju judicial, was also political. And of course, the context for that is very different to the context today anywhere, because the context for that was in the context also of the Soviet Union still being the Soviet Union, right? There was this quote unquote second world that elites in the United States were really worried about black and other dispossessed people turning to mm -hmm. and thinking that is the answer to our problems because we're not finding any answers here. So there was that as well. All of these things um, matter. So I'm really grateful to you, comrade, for um, sharing so much of your knowledge and I look forward to learning more from you soon. Um, I want to say something else about the Soviets and I'm so glad you brought them up. I talked about them last night a little bit. Um, when Comrade Lenin said 100 years ago to some skeptical person, how are you going to maintain this revolution? He said the Soviets and electricity. Now, the Soviets were not all identical. And this is so important. I can't emphasize it enough. And thank you for bringing that up. There was like a Soviet of Muslim women in <laughs> Moscow. There was a Soviet of whoever in some other place, in some other place, in some other place. So we can also, just for the purpose of being able to think the big, imagine that this, the separate and yet connected struggles that are happening here now are kind of all each centered in the equivalent of a Soviet. Whether it's Akhaf Lali, the entire network of communities, or each individual occupation, it's the uh, uh, unions, other form, formations, that these are all effectively Soviets that should constantly be coming together. Um, I want to say something about wages and civil society. Whew, civil society. <laughs> Woo! Civil society. So, all right. So there is this medium for making it possible for capitalism to survive to the next day. And that medium is the wage, right? So if capital could take everything, it would. And even under capitalist slavery, the capitalist slaveholders had to feed their slaves, so they couldn't even take everything, then, right? Capital could take everything it would, but it doesn't. But it takes as much as it can unless there is a struggle, an organized struggle, as Comrade said, for us to keep more of the value we produced. This is just a basic thing. It is no different, however different it might seem, for a domestic worker to struggle with her or their employer over pay and other benefits than a mine worker or a factory worker or an agricultural worker, except that in all of those different kinds of um, work spaces, the organization is quite different, right? There's a different spatial organization, there's the isolation of workers as against workers who work together. There are all different things that in play and that means, of course, that the organizing has got to be specific to the task. There are people, I think I talked about this last night briefly, there are people who have been organizing extremely well 
um, domestic workers, uh, many of whom are vulnerable. Let us, here's an example. Domestic workers in somewhere like Lebanon are generally long distance migrants from places like Eritrea and the Philippines. Right? They are, uh, their passports are taken, et cetera, et cetera. So they are vulnerable. Just as domestic workers here, for different reasons, are really vulnerable. And also, ultimately vulnerable because of being alone in a household. Right? This is a difficult vulnerability. So what people have done is started the hard work of organizing workers. And how does that happen? You don't like go knock on ma'am's door and say, can I please speak to my sister who's working in your kitchen? But get to know people in a variety of ways. Where do people do that initial organizing? They do it in the communities where people live. That is a key site of organizing. Because we, we all know people who do work similar to the work we do, even if we don't work in the same workplace with them. So that is one of the ways. Another way that people do organizing is in the context of transportation. Because so many people have to travel so far to get to work that there have been unions organized in the context of, well, here it would be taxis. In the other places, it's buses or, or something else. So people organize. So that organizing is obviously difficult. It's hard to get people's attention. It's hard to persuade people that taking the risk is going to be um, worth it. But that's true for any worker organizing, no matter the industrial sector. That's true always. Always, always, always. So I already said to Comrade Florence, I'd be happy to share information and resources. There are organizations like, there's something called the National Domestic Workers uh, Union in the States and others, but they are international. They're not just local. Um, but to go back to wages, so there's the wage. And then what happens to the wage? Well, the wage gets circulated. True, cannot control where it goes, but people can be mindful of how it, how it circulates. There is a general principle of economic activity. It's got a really silly name. It's called spread and backwash. Spread and backwash. So just imagine maybe some paint moving across the surface, an uneven surface of land. So the capitalists here, in some core, will decide to put something out here away from where they're at, whether it's a McDonald's or something else, or even a utility like electricity or gas. So that's spread because the capital investment is moving across the territory. Can you picture this with me? You can picture this with me? All right. So then this thing arises at McDonald's or an electrical activity or something else. People participate in it, spend their wages at it. And then the backwash, right? Most of that value goes back to where it came from. Mm -hmm. And so then the question is how to interrupt that. Now, there are many ways to interrupt it. So one is to demand higher wages. Another way to interrupt it is to put up some kind of barrier to it going back. What kind of barrier? Comrade talked about um, cities as constitutional, what was the phrase he used? Actors. Yes. Well, there's an entire movement now in many places around the world that goes under the name municipalism. People are trying to use the capacities of local government and their power to determine what happens in their territories to improve the lives of people who live in those localities. And that kind of work has included things like the local government seizing unoccupied buildings and making those available to people who need shelter. That has included uh, local governments, this happened in Barcelona of all places, the local government uh, uh, decided that it would uh, put a stop to the development of additional tourism hotels. That's a particular thing for Barcelona. But also, for all of those people who own Airbnb 
Mm. So apartments too expensive for ordinary people to live in, right? That they rent out to whoever from afar. The city said, all right, you can do that, but you're gonna pay a really big tax yeah. on it. You must be licensed and be taxed. We're gonna take those taxes and put them into our housing fund. And if we catch you not having a license and not paying your tax, we're gonna seize your property and keep it for, I forget, three or five years. During that time, unhoused people will live there. And at the end of that time, we'll give it back to you. You'll, you'll still have your damn property. But we're gonna use it for the purpose that housing should be used, right? So this isn't perfect, it still has capitalism intact, but we can see the kinds of capacities municipal governments have that they can put into motion if people organize to seize the, that power, develop that capacity. And it was a long struggle for the people who became eventually the leadership in that government, so in that municipal state, to actually get the power to be able to do those things. It took a long time. Another thing that happens with the wage, when it doesn't go to paying for everyday needs, or go to taxes to pay for whatever is going to happen, should be public goods like education and water and so forth. The wage is frequently stolen by philanthropists, right? How do philanthropists steal the wage? The answer is they don't pay taxes on their profit. That's how they steal the wage, right? Because the profit is wages that are held by the capitalist, and there is no philanthropy that it wasn't formed by capitalists, right? So they steal the wage. So I have a way for us to think about philanthropy, which doesn't mean we don't take their damn money. And the way to think about it is philanthropy is private allocation of the stolen social wage. That's what it is. So since that's what it is, we should go after philanthropy the same way we go after the state. It's ours, we should take it. So if some philanthropist says, here's some resources to build something that you need, you cut as many of the conditions off it as possible, take the money and run, and do the things we need to do. And do the things we need to do. But here's where the trick is. There's been such a global organization of like official civil society. It's no joke. And the NGOs are, you know, front and center trying to like train everyone to be civilly in society. <laughs> this is a problem, not a solution. Why is it a problem? Is it a problem because all of the people in those NGOs have bad faith? No, of course not. That's absurd. Is it because the missions of those NGOs are not, at least on paper, the mission to make life better for people? No, that's not the case either. But one of the problems that's happened in NGOs, just as this happened in, in as Comrad was explaining, EFF is in government and not a square inch of land has been redistributed, right? What happens is what we might call professionalization. Now there's nothing wrong with having a profession. I have one, I'm a professor. Right? I'm a professional professor. And there are other people who do other kinds of professions. Nothing wrong with that at all. Expertise is a good thing. But what comes with professionalization is that the people who do a certain kind of work organize themselves with other people who do the same kind of work and determine together how that work should proceed. Right? I'm an academic in geography, that's what geographers do. Right? Being organized is not a bad thing. But we can see how the NGOization of politics through throwing up the veil of civil society has proceeded in such a way that so much of what results is just talk rather than action. This, this is where we're at, comrades. Mm -hmm. And so what we should do is what they do. They're organized, we have to be organized. Not like them, as in with those forms and imperatives, but 
like us, mm -hmm. we who have been talking together today. And I know we can do it because I keep learning from everyone. Every time somebody says anything, I hear something I never knew before. And so somebody else in this room also has heard something they didn't know before. And we come together at the end, not just exchange contact, but make a plan for the next step. And I think uniting all of the anti-eviction cases is the most brilliant thing. That should happen. That should happen. And many other things. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll just be really quick. There's just, I think Comrade Ruthie spoke so beautifully and amazingly well about so much. But I just wanted to add around the NGO question and civil society. The, you know, historically, you often had a group of nice people that accompanied the imperializing colonial power, mm -hmm. and they were missionaries. Mm -hmm. And I often think of NGOs as modern day missionaries, <laughs> like teaching us how to accommodate ourselves to power. Mm -hmm. uh, Issa Shivji writes really excellent work about the NGOization of politics in Africa mm -hmm. and the ways in which that actually depoliticized the political movements. And if you think about the trajectory and history of our political movements, not just here in India, in Pakistan, in Africa, in Latin America, you have this movement happening the, after the period of colonization. And what, what uh, Tariq Ali, who is a famous uh, Pakistani radical, uh, says he calls them Western government organizations. Mm -hmm. Now, like Comrade Ruthie said, you know, people who work in NGOs aren't inherently bad. They're not doing something. They often meet people who really believe in a, in, a, in a type of work. But the form of the NGO, the way in which they call you into meetings, the way in which they have to run workshops, those things are not aligned necessarily to the struggles on the ground at all times. Mm -hmm. So they, they want to meet their needs as well. So there's this constant tension and struggle. So yes, we can use NGOs like we need to use the law as a tactic. Mm -hmm. But the power must reside with the organizations, right. not with the NGOs. And you find the constant co-option of certain leaders of, in, of, of, of movements into NGOs. They'll be given a job, or they'll be given more money, or they'll be invited to things all the time to come to. And then they learn the speak. So they yes. start speaking <laughs> as we normally speak in a movement meeting. They now start introducing NGO speak into those things, right? <laughs> I mean, if you think about the feminist movement that happens a lot in the feminist movement, there's words that the black feminist movement, the radical feminist movement, Marxist feminist movements have. But then there's words that come out of the NGO space and come into the movements, and you, you immediately start seeing that happening. Uh, so I think that's something we need to be aware of, not saying don't engage, but think about how we engage this. Because the form often of the NGO is, let's unite the left. And that's great, we need to unite the left. But the left is made up of many... Yeah, yeah, but that's the, but that's the thing. Right. So, so, so it will be, in, but, but, yeah. the, but the task of working class organizations is to organize the working class. Mm -hmm. That's the difference. Our task is not to, yes, we have to be left, we have to have our ideology intact, but our task is not just to unite the left as that. Our task is to unite and activate the working class. That is what we need to do as working class formations. The NGO can continue doing their work, that's fine like the academics, like anyone, the accountants, the lawyers. But I think it's very important for people within the working class movements to understand their power, to take it up, and really mobilize around that. Mm -hmm. And you know, in South Africa, we have a history of, of actually being lucky because we have a strong labor movement. A lot of it has been co-opted. It's an incredibly mm -hmm. difficult space to work in, but it's there. And it is one of the most vibrant aspects of our democracy at the moment. And then just one last point, I think, on, on, on the law. I think it's incredibly important about the law. Comrade Ruthie and I were speaking earlier about Lenin's what is to be done. And you know, he spoke about how was he going to maintain power, Soviets and electrification. But he also had stack tactics and strategies about how to organize and build the power of the Soviets and the working class within a bourgeois democracy, which 
It wasn't what they had in Russia. We have much more of that. Here, how to do that, how to use certain things. Within the labor movement, we use the law constantly. I mean, if we didn't have a progressive constitution, we couldn't strike, for example. And that is what we need to constantly be working with, is pushing that forward. So yes, the alliance with the bourgeoisie is very important. Um, Christmas is coming up now, and I'm sure you'll see Christmas trees all over, everywhere you go, right? Uh, and it's seen in a variety of different ways. But what it reminds me of is a different time of abolition, was the abolitionist movement against slavery mm -hmm. in the United States, when the abolitionists, in order to make slavery a topic of discussion for middle class people, would at the Christmas markets sell the Christmas tree and talked about how the Christmas tree is not to touch some, something we can't touch as a subject like slavery. So they inverted that and they said to, to show your support for the abolitionist movement, take on this Christmas tree, have it in your home to think about this. And that's a way in which you can begin to create a unification. Because in that movement, a lot of things, like during the Jim Crow abolitionist movement, mm -hmm. was used. It was the, the Quakers, the church, middle class. All of those things need to be brought in. And in the 1980s in South Africa, that did happen. Large parts of the, of the country were activated on different levels, being able to help each other. I think we need to study that period. And we need to think about how it is we're going to recreate that and redo that work because it's incredibly important to be able to shelter each other, to give each other courage, and to give each other knowledge of what it is we need and what it is each of us can do for each other. So I think that's really important. Thank you. Okay, Comrade uh, Mulele says it's time for us to close up. Uh, I would like to probably ask Comrade Ruthi to say something before we end. Okay. All right. Oh, this has really been a great afternoon. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I hope that people felt as energized by what we have managed to learn together today as, as I do. Um, I, I'm sorry I didn't uh, discuss every question that was raised. So I'm going to close out with a question that you asked, um, Comrade Sister, about personal, personal struggle. Um, and this isn't personal, just me, but a struggle in a small organization, mostly women, who were trying to figure out what to do on behalf of their children, some of whom were adults, but children who had been arrested and taken away. So women would meet every, I forget which night it was, every Monday night. The, everybody knew, because we put flyers around all over Los Angeles, that if you turned up at a particular address on a Monday night at 6 o'clock, there would be somebody there to talk to you about your loved one's case. We were just there. We were there every week, no matter what. And so people came, they came slowly, they came over time, and at first they thought that they would just have the opportunity to say to somebody who would believe them that they were going through something terrible, that that alone lifted a burden from the hearts and minds and lives of people who came through the, through the door. But then people would sit and listen to others tell their stories and became really perplexed by how all these stories told by strangers were so familiar. They were confused because they already knew strangers' stories. So this then created the conditions where people who came, came back and came back because there was something very exciting about meeting in a room with strangers who already knew your story that you felt you had been experiencing alone. Right? So we go from loneliness to a group. Early on, though, as the group continued to be together, the expectation on the part of many who came was, oh, we're just going to help each other in really minimal ways, um, important ways, but small. So if somebody was going to court, 
to uh, hear their love, because their loved one's case was going to be heard, someone else would go with them. So they wouldn't be alone. And if somebody else was confused because their loved one was charged under a law, nobody understood a new crime nobody had heard about before, somebody else would say, oh, I understand that. Let me explain. So it was just really self-help. You get my drift? So it comes together, people are alone, then they're together, but they're helping each other in a rather individual way. But as things got more and more difficult, this group, which named itself after mothers here in South Africa, they called themselves Mother's Rock. Right? You've touched a rock, you've touched a child. You've touched a rock, you have dislodged a boulder, you will be crushed. Yeah. They named themselves after women here in South Africa. They started, which is to say we started, to talk about how we had to do something bigger than what we had been doing. That somehow this group had to become a political force. But many people in that group were not ready to use that word, political. That seemed to be about something else and someone else. And they were there to save their children and in unity with other people wanted some other children to be saved as well. But it wasn't political. We had debates and debates and debates about this. But the form of the debate, which kind of emerged almost organically, was I think critical to the success of the organization. And that is that nobody ever interrupted somebody else. That was the first thing. We didn't say it, we just never did it. We just never did it. So if somebody wanted to speak from her mind, from her heart, from her notebook, she could speak until she was done. So it's kind of like, I don't know if anybody here is an alcoholic, I am. It's like when you go to an AA meeting, you tell your story, nobody talks at you. You tell your story until you're done. Then the next person tells their story. Right, so it kind of work like that. Then, so people would go around and talk about their understanding of politics. And there were many conclusions that people drew over time. Now, I was really eager for everybody to like jump into the political arena, but I also knew that it was impossible for me to just say magically, okay, we're ready, because we weren't. There was no we that was ready. There were other people in the organization, particularly one of the greatest organizers I have ever known in my life, a person called Jerry Silva, who um, had been organizing as a member of the Communist Party for many years and then in a, uh, an independent um, organization after that for many, many years. Greatest organizer I've ever known besides Rose Brass. And Jerry at one point said, look, Comrade sisters, here's the situation. They've got two laws in this country. And one of the mothers said, oh, I think I know what you're talking about. They do have two laws in this country. There's one for white people and one for black people. Right? <coughs> Everybody's ears go. But not everybody in this group was black. There were brown people too. There was an Asian American man. So somebody else said, no, I think it's for white people and people of color. And everybody debated that. And then Jerry said, eh, it's rich people and poor people. And everybody debated that. The reason the group didn't fall apart was because the group's kind of method of being together, again, came out organically. We didn't write down bylaws and then follow the bylaws. The group's method of being together was based in the fact that many people in this group were very active in their faith organizations, just happened to be that kind of group, which is very common among black people in the United States. Not me, but many black people. So we would start our meetings and end our meetings with somebody offering a prayer. Now, what I did at the beginning of this meeting with Comrade Vashna did at the beginning of the meeting was like the equivalent of the prayer. 
which is to say, to lay out for everyone in the room an understanding of what brought us together and a suggestion of what our agenda should be. Right? So we would start that way, and then we would end that way. So the closing prayer, which is what I'm doing now, would summarize where we had gotten to and then highlight the struggles that we could see waiting ahead for us. It was very theoretical. Nobody used the word theory. It was very practical. These people really wanted to win. And it helped us go from what could have been a very horrible and destructive um, personal confrontation about no, we should be communists, no, we should be this, no, we should be that, into a group that acted as a political formation, even though I tell you they never called themselves political. They didn't need to. They did politics. And then they formed groups that did more politics that eventually became abolitionists. Because that was the early 90s. 30 years later, they're abolitionists. So that is the answer to your question, which was not one-on-one -on -one interpersonal, but it was personal. So thanks for asking it. Thank you, comrades, for coming. Thank you for your solidarity. I can't wait for our next opportunity to be together. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, comrades. Uh, I think we will end with that lovely high note. And I hope we are able to carry the spirit forward, but also make real concrete connections here today. Thank you so much. Thank you.